I'm Alice Solero and I'm a photographer. I was a music and theater major in college and then I did a cross-country trip across the United States and was very frustrated not knowing how my camera works to capture what I was seeing. And so I came home and was um, intrigued to study photography. So while I was working full-time during the evenings, I enrolled in New England School of Photography down in Kenmore Square for a two-year program. It caught, yeah. I think I had the bug even before I went to that school, but once I went to that school, and then I was hired right away out of school for a photography job, and I've been doing it ever since. I'm not sure if I could pigeonhole myself into one area. Um, and I do some, actually I do some photojournalism also. As I've gone on with my work in the few years that I've been, in many years that I've been teaching, I am more drawn to abstracts in nature. Just lately, that has been a new kind of observation of mine. It's all digital now, but I started with black and white film and my own dark room, and then I went to slides and did a lot of you know, E6 processing and printing, and now I'm in digital. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. I, I love the quickness of digital. I love the fact that you can delete so much right away. Um, the post-production has been a learning curve for me in terms of Photoshop and Lightroom. But I loved black and white printing and I loved that whole process of being in the darkroom. It was magical to me. What I love is hearing which pieces people are attracted to and why. Because everyone has a different opinion. And it's all what, what speaks to each person. So this is a piece I shot on Martha's Vineyard. Um, on the dunes there at different times of the year, I usually went in the summer, uh, the mud comes down the dunes and creates these very strange pathways. Um, this was taken at sunset, so this is actually mud hitting sand, but when I flipped the image over, it looked like little trees to me, or little fingers, and so I'm, I'm hanging it upside down. That's kind of an insight that I didn't shoot it that way, but when I flipped it upside down, I liked it even better. This I shot in a workshop um, about autumn, you know, and colors of autumn, and then we also dealt with water. So this is a slow shutter speed shot where the waterfall was coming around and kind of getting caught in a whirlpool effect. And this is, um, I just bought this beautiful head of red romaine lettuce at a farmer's market. And before I started chomping on it, I just said, I have to photograph this. Because I'd never seen such a gorgeous head of red romaine lettuce. Um, usually, most people buy green, and it was just gorgeous. And I spent the whole afternoon photographing it, and then I had it for dinner. Well, I'm inspired by light and color, pattern, shape, texture, all of those things. And with portraits, I'm fascinated by um, people's expressions and faces and how much they emote through their expressions. I always find that art is something very personal to each person and that if you find an image that speaks to you, figure out why and then explore that more. So if you didn't think you were a nature person, I would say, you know, see if there's an image that speaks to you even though you think that you're totally a city person and then explore that more. Practice, practice, practice. Like any art form, you just have to keep going at it. I mean, I have students who all the time just say, why do I have to shoot so much? And you have to keep shooting. I have to keep forcing myself to shoot because things are changing all the time and you might discover something at one time of day and it looks completely different at another time of day. So keep going back and find out what your passion is, find out what your direction is. Find out if photography even works for you at all, yeah. I'd like to keep doing abstract work and travel. I'm, I'm a huge lover of travel, so I, want, there's, I have a long bucket list of places I still want to go. Hi, I'm Barbara Graceffa. I'm a local interior decorator doing business as Secretary of the Interior. Uh, you might recognize my, my name because I write for the Quincy Sun. Uh, uh, decorating column. I first started quilting right after the bicentennial when um, quilting had a resurgence as a, as a craft and I think uh, I actually made my first quilt in 1980 when I was still in college. 
Uh, I had no money to buy my uh, fiance uh, a nice Christmas gift. So I was a sewer in, in the past, so I had lots of scrap fabrics left over. So I made him a, a scrap quilt as a, um, as a Christmas gift. And I really just got hooked. I, I enjoyed um, the creative part of it, the putting the colors together, and um, I, I then took uh, advanced quilting classes and lots of books, taught myself, um, and I've just been hooked for many, many years on doing quilts. It's called the Carpenter's Wheel. It's um, teal and white and gray, and uh, my brother's a draftsman, so um, a carpenter's wheel is typically like a 12-inch square, but I had him blow up the pieces to make one giant square. I won a blue ribbon at the Marshfield Fair uh, for that quilt. Uh, it was uh, viewer's choice. So it was on display and um, the people who went to the fair chose that as their favorite. Love those lilies. It is what we call a fractured quilt. Um, I chose a couple pieces of fabric that they call cheater cloth. Um, it's a printed fabric with lilies on it. So I think I bought three of the panels that are exactly the same and I cut them up and then I cut out some of the lilies and appliqued them on um, this, um, this quilt. And uh, I added a nice big uh, batik orange and yellow appliqued sun in the upper left-hand corner. So it looks like the sun is, is flowing over my favorite flowers. Cathedral Forest. And that has a, a, a lot of sentimental value to both my husband and I. My husband's great aunt was a nun and she wore the old-fashioned long black habits and family members had bought her fabric to have the habits made and one of another aunt gave me the leftover fabric so that fabric the black background fabric is used in this stained glass quilt that's called cathedral forest so it actually from afar it looks like a stained glass quilt but the forest part comes in with the black background and the white fabrics too. So if you stand back, you're gonna see white tree branches and black tree branches. And uh, that is one of my favorite quilts. Um, I give a lot of my quilts away as gifts, uh, but this one I never will. This hangs in my home almost all the time. A lot of people ask me how long does it take to create a quilt. For example, um, the stained glass quilt. Uh, I did that on vacation one week, and I actually kept track. It was just about 40 hours to put together this wall hanging. That's maybe 40 by 60 inches long. And, um, but other quilts take a lot longer. It depends on the in intricacy of the pattern, um, whether or not you're making a scrap quilt, or it actually does have a pattern that you have to follow. So um, I tend to do more uh, wall hangings nowadays. Um, so sometimes I can finish them in a weekend. Sometimes it takes quite a bit longer. Traditional are the old patchwork quilts that your grandma probably had. Um, sewn together from squares or diamonds or triangles. Um, typically with calico fabrics um, with um, tiny little flowers on them. Um, I started out that way. Many of my quilts were like that. Um, I created a lot of scrap quilts, meaning with leftover fabric from other projects, so that the color choice wasn't a big concern. Um, but as I developed more quilts, and um, color choice is important. Um, and then more recently I've gotten into contemporary quilts. Um, raw edge applique, meaning um, you don't have to tuck the fabric under for a smooth edge. How do I choose what I want to make? Inspiration comes all, from all different sources. Um, I'm a big fan of Pinterest. I find uh, inspiration there. I go to local quilt shows. If you're interested in quilting, I say start slowly. Um, get yourself a basic book at the library. Um, it will teach you what tools you need other than a sewing machine. There are certain rulers um, that are helpful, um, certain cutting tools. Uh, uh, that will um, help you um, make a quilt more efficiently. Um, and do something that you like. Create something for your own home. Choose colors that um, you can hang on the wall or, or match your current beds, bedroom colors. Um, choose something that comes from the heart.
and do it. Just do it. Give it a try. I'm Dan Myers from Quincy Art Association. I teach uh, portrait and figure sculpture at the, uh, at the Quincy Art Association. And my, my partner, Chris Kreitman, we run the Tuesday night open studio life drawing class. And um, that's been my function at Quincy Art for about 20, uh, 20 years. Faith, Hope and Love, it's a sculpture, it takes up quite a bit of space. And it got honored by the Art Renewal uh, Organization. It was in their um, 12th Salon. It's an international show of realistic art uh, about 2016. It's fairly large. It features at least eight figures. It's got a family group on top with uh, mother, father, son and daughter, and four cherubs that represent uh, all the ethnic groups of humanity. That sculpture is cast in polyurethane resin, and it's got a, just a white finish to make it look sort of like marble. It doesn't fool anybody, but uh, it was created in uh, plastilina, which is synthetic uh, clay. It took, I'd say, three and a half years uh, because there were three prototypes. It took me all, every prototype I had a different idea, and it didn't, it took me till the last prototype to figure out I wanted them floating in the air, not just standing. So uh, with the idea changes, and uh, it took about, it's about a thousand hours of work altogether, but it took three and a half years to, um, I guess, uh, incubate. That one is called Nude Gallery 1 because I got Nude Gallery 2 <laughs> this year. And that's a painting of one of our models at the Quincy Life class. Up in the corner, you've got uh, Matisse. Uh, down below is Picasso, I believe. Over on the right is Bougereau, and on the bottom right is Modigliani. So it's four, uh, three modern art treatments of the nude, and uh, Bougereau is considered the greatest figure painter of the 19th century. So it's a lot of representations of the human body, and. Um, how artists have um, uh, looked at it over the years. That image is, I call that life class drawing. Of course, our, we had that, that mod, particular model didn't appear at our life class, that came out of a photograph. And I call that spectrum. I have several names, so either spectrum or free fall. So uh, again, uh, the nude is uh, central to the life class um, uh, effort and uh, one of my favorite subjects. My favorite part is uh, these two, <laughs> my grandson Jack and my granddaughter Eva Rose, he's just, he's about five and a half. She's about 14, 15 months, almost ready to walk. My name is Barbara Newman, or Barb, and I, I'm a photographer as an amateur photographer and like to travel doing landscape photography. I was a regular photographer doing travel, just traveling and taking pictures for a long time. And when digital came out, it took a lot longer to figure out how to work it, so I took a break in between film and digital. And somewhere along the way, I decided to try again and took classes and took more classes and took more classes and started traveling with it. And it was, it's a lot of fun. I'm a contractor, work doing um, project management and business analysis and technology. I think it's just something that I, you know, when I like to travel, I used to go to California and it was so gorgeous and beautiful. You want to take pictures of Big Sur or this or that. And I found out I had an eye and people always said, you have a nice eye. And so I would take pictures and blow them up and put them on my wall, <laughs> like everyone else does. And it was my souvenir of a trip. And somehow I got more serious. And when I signed, I wanted to go to Iceland for Northern Lights. And that was my first big workshop. And when you're somewhere at night, standing outside with a camera for hours on end, you learn. You just keep taking pictures and you adjust and you learn and it was great. Part of it is being in the moment. People don't think of that. They think you're hiding behind a camera, but I found it to be the opposite. Because if I go to, went to Iceland on my own without the camera, I would have looked up and I would have said, oh, how pretty. And two minutes later, I would have left. But with the camera, I'm out there for hours. And I get to look at the sky and see shooting stars and see Milky Way and see, you know, the Aurora Borealis and all this stuff that I never saw before. So there's a peaceful moment about it or hours about it. And I've also met a lot of people, so there's the social aspect. People from other areas that I meet up with to take pictures that we keep in touch and we try to organize and see if we want to go to the same places. So it's kind of fun. It's a very expensive hobby. You sell pictures here and there, but there's so many people doing it now, it's actually becoming very popular. Um, at the let, you know, when people are retiring, they're starting to get expensive cameras and they are doing, you know, signing up for workshops. 
It's a great way to see national parks um, or to travel. Nature is definitely my strong point, landscaping, but also nighttime. So I realized I just went to Yosemite and it was mostly sunrise, sunset, so it's about lighting. But I realized I missed not having any night light, night shots, like the moons and the stars. So we actually did go out one night and try it, but it was, there wasn't enough light. <laughs> there was no moon. So I realized that there's a mood to photographs that have night in it. It's something people don't get to see that often because we don't spend time outside, especially being a city person. So I realized I want to go back to doing more night photography, but I'm also trying to learn for portrait photography, just for me personally, not for something to, you know, for friends, just to help them out. Iceland, the Northern Lights every night was an experience of a lifetime. There were four women that had taken it together. We were the only ones in the class, and it was, for all of us, it was a wow moment. Every time we went outside, whether it was morning or night, you know, before the, you know, for the Northern Lights or for the morning light, it was just wow. I kept calling it magic. It's magic. It's magic. <laughs> um, and then the other one was Milky Ways. So Milky Ways in Arches National Park was outrageous. You know, I knew it, never would have seen it. So it was great. There's a photo of morning. It's actually the morning sun at Mesa, um, Mesa Arch in Canyonland, Utah. So I was out there doing the Milky Way at night and stayed all the way till the next morning because there's a lot of there's a very small space and a lot of people try to get those same photographs. So it's believe it or not, it can be aggressive. <laughs> So I just stayed there all night till the next morning and took shots at first light. And that's the part that people don't understand. They think, you know, daytime photography would be great because the sun's out, but it actually washes it out. So it's first thing in the morning. So that photograph is from Arches National Park, Milky Way. Again, Milky Way is one of my favorite shots. The ice cave. This was a birthday gift. I was in Iceland for my birthday and asked if I could take a picture of a cave. They are caves that are there for a very short time and when the snow melts, they're gone. So that, that's my, those are my photos. Look for a work, photography workshop, whether it's birds you like to photograph, or the sky, or anything, find a workshop, because you learn so much in, a, in one week, it's incredible. Now, I would gladly help someone to find a workshop if they need that help, because it's, you know, it, you go to work and you come home, it's great to have something else in your life, so I highly recommend it. I'm William McDonald, I'm a local artist. Basically, it started when I was a little kid. I was the only kid in the second grade who could really draw a Popeye. And that was the first thing anyone had ever noticed about me that was particularly special, I think, is, wow, this kid can draw a Popeye. And so once you can be good at something, then it becomes something that you pick up on and keep doing and keep growing with and that sort of thing. So that was really where it all started with Popeye. A lot of my work is fairly small. It is not highly chromatic or highly value contrasted. And there's an indication that people maybe can relate to it in, an air, in a way that's a little bit more quiet than a lot of contemporary art, which tends to grab you a little bit by the throat. In general, it tends to be of monumental size. It tends to be strong. This is something that people can look at a little bit more intimately and maybe uh, look at close up rather than standing at a distance and try to relate to a little bit. The whole purpose of, of the exhibit is to try to give people a sense of who the people are in those drawings and paintings and help them to feel when they walk away from that exhibit that they've met somebody else. They've, they've actually met these people the way they actually are. There's a group of artists who hire a model the model is often a professional model, sometimes they're not, they're just a regular person, or, you know, somebody knows. And they come in and they sit or stand or recline for two and a half, three hours, sometimes short poses, sometimes one single long pose. And everybody in the room, usually a semicircle around the person, and they split the costs. So it's, it's very efficient. You don't have to have your own studio, which I don't have. And um, it's just very cost effective as well. You also get an insight into different people. These are all people, whether they're professional models or not, who are the kind of people you might see on the subway, people you might sit next to at lunch. It's they're just regular people. Basically, that was an interesting situation. She was hired for three sessions, three two and a half hour sessions, the same pose. Now, typically you might do a painting because you have enough time to do a painting in this kind of situation. But what I did is I put my chair in one position and spent one session drawing her, 
then moved it slightly to the right for the next week for the next session. And then the third week I moved it slightly further to the right. So you had the same pose, the same person, the same clothing, the same everything, except from three slightly different angles. And that sort of thing has always intrigued me. When I was a kid, I collected baseball cards because it was the same baseball player through the years, maybe different um, caps, different uniforms, but you could see the same person changing throughout time. And in this case, the only thing that changed was really the position of, of the chair. The really intriguing thing about this for me was her left leg, um, her right leg rather, which is left on the picture. If you look at the outside of that leg, there's a strong diagonal going down to the left lower corner of the drawing. The diagonal interested me, but also the decision about how much detail to include in that leg versus how much to concentrate on the main masses of the leg. That sounds a little bit arcane, but it's something that's really a question that you see in a lot of areas in your life, basically. It's a metaphor. How much attention do you pay to the large portions of the thigh and, and the calf and all that sort of thing, which is what most contemporary uh, uh, artists would focus on? And how much attention do you pay to the, all those little inlets going down? It's the little inlets that also make the person appear a little bit more human. And so you have to balance that off. And it's a lot like life. You have to balance off the particulars and, and the details with the overall picture. And that's what intrigued me about it. That was actually, um, he was the boyfriend of one of the models who had posed previously uh, for us. And he came in. I included that because it was red. It started off as a regular graphite drawing and then I did red pencil over it. So in a way, it's a little bit of a three color situation. Thirdly, it's also an interesting uh, thing in terms of the uh, photograph itself because it sort of shows some of the shortcomings of photography when it comes to this sort of thing, or at least my camera, because it really doesn't look that much like the drawing if you come to see it. The background on the photo is quite gray. The paper itself is very white. And unless I, I had Photoshop or something like that, I couldn't really fix the relationship between the drawing itself and the background. So it shows you just how a camera doesn't see the portrait the same way as a human eye sees it. And uh, I got uh, kind of a kick out of seeing that. When you look at a person for hours on end, they can't fake it. It's not like you put a camera in front of them and say, say cheese, and they do this, you know, smile that everybody does. They're sitting there for two and a half and three hours. Often people will say to you, well, they're not smiling. Why aren't they smiling? Everyone looks so serious in years. Well, yeah, they're sitting there for three hours. But if you stare at somebody <laughs> for two and a half and three hours, and they're under a light a little bit like this light is on me, they can't fake it anymore. And if you do that over a period of years, you start to see the person and you start to see into the person in a way that they probably don't see into themselves. Hopefully they don't spend three hours looking in a mirror but I spend that long looking at them. Do that over 20 years and you see a lot. You try for a certain amount of diversity in, in terms of hanging these things, but I'm perfectly fine in drawing exactly the same pose with exactly the same model. Uh, I, I remember there was one case where I drew the same pose with the same model and the expression on her face was slightly different. I had one model come up to me at break and look at it and at what I was doing and say, that's funny, I was pretty angry coming here and I thought that I wasn't really, I thought I was hiding that pretty well, but it's coming through when you're drawing. You know, it's that kind of thing, you, you, you know, you just, you're not really going for a different meaning each time. You may be going for a different technique, something like that, but the basic meaning is the same. You're trying to put down on a piece of paper or on a piece of canvas or masonite what you think that person is at that particular moment or during that particular duration in such a way that the next person who comes along can look at it and say, yeah, okay, I see, you know? And they bring their own perceptions, of course, and everything like that. But basically, when you put the three things together, who the person really is, how the person 
is the way I saw them, how the person is, the way the viewer sees the resulting artwork. You have kind of a three point, I don't know if you have, three point plane that, that actually describes what it's really all about. That's probably a poor way of explaining it, but that's sort of how it is.